You're listening to the Adventuring Party for the third week of July, 2023. This week, the party discuss how to settle down, invest your dragon treasure in a nice doom fortress, and become a pillar of the community. And why none of you degenerates will take that advice. The Adventuring Party, discussing tabletop and radio gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Shane. I'm Owen. And I'm Kiffer. Yes, joining us again is our wonderful uh, guest, Kiffer of the Kiffer Geo Twitch stream. And, um, you know, we're all sitting comfortably, uh, surrounded by our uh, high-level podcast equipment and our many spoils of war after 750 podcasting episodes. And why would anyone, you know, ever just, you know, ignore their personal hovel their cave of wonders and just wander around doing good deeds that seems very weird doesn't it um and yet the murder hobo the heroic murder hobo of legend the 18th level fighter who you know lives in a a bag of holding that with legs and his friend the wizard who never teleports to the same place twice these are staples of our gaming genre and why would that be? Surely everyone needs a place to call home base. There's a voice that keeps calling me down the road. That's where I'll always be. Every stop I make, I kill some new people. Can't stay for long. Just turn around and I'm gone again. Woo! Littlest hobo. The littlest hobo. The littlest murder hobo. The end of uh, every episode of the old Hulk TV show, where they would play the, 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 the lonely piano music as he walks down the road. He didn't have a home base because he was a solo person out on his own. The same with the little hobo. You know, you arrive in a situation, you help that situation out, and then you go on your way with only the shirt on your back and a handful of pennies in your pocket. Yeah. Well, notably, the Incredible Hulk was not known for his vast pile of plus three broadswords that he liberated from the Hobgoblin King. He was, we might call it a self-reliant individual. He had those magic pants, though. Uh, yeah, like, but those are part of his character build, apparently. Also, his genius level intellect and a phenomenal strength. You know, just not at the same time. Uh, Banner had those. Yeah. The way that we treat our um, need for lodging and you know, a place to go back home to in an RPG is often very... It, it bears a bit of examination. Like, we talk about D&D... Like early D and D seer episodes on the Tome of Gygax, for example, and the the re- the assumptions baked into the uh, original A D and D game was very much as this like, oh, um, you you need to you need to you know for the first couple of levels you spend you, you have to scrimp and save to get lodgings for both you and your henchmen in every, in every major town, and here's a you know fourteen charts on how every good, lawful good tavern owner will screw uh, an adventure out of every penny they have. And then, of course, as soon as you hit level nine, obviously you want a massive castle and a, an army of thousands of hobolars and elven smiths to make chainmail. And you just you go straight from first gear to fifth gear in the property ladder. And obviously that's how every player wants. And then people actually started playing D&D and a huge number of people said, Wait, I've got a bag of holding. I've got a paladin's horse that never tires. Why don't I just walk around the country doing good deeds and uh, never sleep in the same bed twice? And the game did not provide great answers because the assumptions were in the heads of uh, the early D&D designers and not in the heads of the people playing the game. I think once you can cast Wall of Stone, you can build a tower anywhere. Anywhere, everywhere you go, if you stop there for more than three days, there should be a tower left behind. Yeah, it's like some people play Minecraft building their own castle, and some people just walk in a direction and uh, build a new house every night. Build a new house every night. If you're if you're a traveling wizard, why you're not going to stay in the worst inn you can find, and you're also not going to sleep bivouacking under a tree. It will make you easier to follow, though. Look, he's at it again. We're on, we're on his trail, everybody. <laughs> The wizard who keeps leaving towers behind him. 
but that's it. That's that's a plot point in um, one of the uh, the early Drizzt books, where they track the guy because he has a um, he's 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 a human wizard surviving in the Underdark, and he has an instant fortress, and it's an adamantine tower, but he keeps using it in areas that are maybe slightly too small for it. And it displaces the rock above it, so there's always like a, a hole in the ceiling, and it digs into the ground a little bit, so there's always a hole in the ground after he's left it. So every night he stops and he drops his instant fortress, and there you go. They track him. Every cave they find that has this telltale circle in the ground and circle in the, in the roof, that's where he was, just quite recently. You know, there's no fungus in that area, so we know it's been in the last while because the fungus hasn't grown back. But if your party are murder hoboing their way around an area then are they going from mission to mission do they need a home base is there a temporary home base where they arrive in a town and go the, the inn is our home base now mm. you you've you've collected a dragon's hoard does that entire thing fit in the bag of holding no it does not so where do you hide it where do you keep it how do you get it home the, and then you run into the situation where a uh, the entire group decides you do not want to answer that question and simply browbeat the GM to not worry about it and also there are no thieves in this town because you know we're high level and therefore there are no thieves and uh, and no one attempts to raise prices no one attempts. we we get our 100% of the value of the dragon's hoard even though we just left in the shed because you know we decided we were just going to browbeat you Mr. GM or maybe I'm being too mean to the players but like why don't people want to deal with the, the issues I, oh wait the, the modern housing market might explain it quite a bit now to think about it is the fantasy of, of home ownership they should love the idea. It should be like, my God, I can't have a house in real life, but I can have a house in Waterdeep. Well, it depends on you know how the how the house... I don't think the house, house pricing in Waterdeep is that great, because I'm pretty sure Waterdeep is another uh, city designed to fleece uh, adventurers of their coin. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. But what if that house were to mysteriously burn down and then be going cheap? You, get a, you do a crassus job on it, where... You put the fire out and then you go, this this house is, or even while it's still burning, you buy it off the owner and go, this house is pretty bad. Then you replace it with castings of Wall of Stone. Then the guild people come and get you. I can see why you wouldn't want to live in Waterdeep. <laughs> but certainly one of the villages outside Waterdeep wouldn't say no to having adventurers living there. Just build a little, little keep. Keep your stuff in it. You've got to have somewhere to come back to or else what's the point? I think part of the issue is that there's Okay, there's there's two thrusts to the issue. One is let's call it the property ladder. It's not quite the right term for, but like the point of where where you go from um, renting a room in the tavern to I own a small hut that we bury our gold underneath. To I have you know the the fortress of thousand dooms upon the mountain of twilight. W when is the transition point there versus um, the tie down? You know, the, the the feeling of being tied down because this is going to be a very Irish thing that maybe your American listeners don't know. In, in Ireland, uh, plastic shopping bags, uh, we've for the last 20 years, we've been uh, the government has like charged like 20 cents uh, for plastic shopping bag, bag. And this has resulted in a very particularly Irish phenomenon, what I like to call the bag of bags underneath your sink, where you like you have like a bag full of plastic bag full of plastic bags. And the idea is when you're leaving, you take one uh, out to do your shopping, take a couple of them with you to do your shopping with. But then the, the, on the occasions where you're out and about and you say, oh, I need to do some shopping and you don't have a bag. So you have to buy another bag and it's this bag of shame that you have to come back home with and then put it into your bag of bags. The bag of bags. Yeah. Mm. I, have a, I have a solution to that, which is I keep, keep a cloth bag in the cargo pants pocket of my, my trousers because uh, I am a seasoned murder hobo and therefore I know you must always have a bag of holding on you. But as you say, you've still got to get home with that bag, Shane. Yeah. And this, I mean, we're sort of running into a whole bunch of other issues. It's like the inconvenience of having to go a thousand miles into the desert of desolation you know, rob the mummy's tomb and then drag all of the thousands of gold pieces and sarcophaguses and such all the way back to your home base to then presumably flog in the black market or whatever. These are 
entirely realistic and sensible things that grave robbers throughout history had to deal with all, all, all through their careers. I wouldn't say it's showered in glory, though. And if your game is particularly glory focused, then maybe the process, this long, slow process of hiring mules and bribing your, all of your local Sherpa guides just enough so that they don't, you know, steal from your, your horde and all of these there's social issues. These could be massive elements of drama and logistical challenges and puzzles and social engineering and such. All kinds of stuff, uh, interesting g- gameplay. But if you're here to apply sword to man and, uh, you know, cast your, your fireballs and you were kind of hoping to not have to engage in HR and logistics, could we just like, you know, find a stone of teleporting in, in, in the first uh, lobby of this in this dungeon so that we can just haul everything home, please, Mr. Jam, please. It would be ever so ha- helpful. We will never, we will stop complaining and burning down all the villages on the way. I think, well, I think you've, you've hit something there, Shane, which is that if they're traveling a thousand miles to the desert of despair with their very important ranger character to travel through the desert because no one else could possibly survive in the desert except for a ranger, then, yeah, they're going to need those teams of donkeys to get back to their home base. But are people going to do that? No. No one does overland travel anymore properly. No one is going to do out the minutiae of it. No one wants to roll all those random encounters. It's asking for trouble. It's asking for trouble. People want to do these short adventures with the, the stone of teleport that brings them back to wherever they're going. I, I think for one of the campaigns I ran, I just had them get a Stargate at the start and all the adventures were episodic. Um, and it was the gnomes in the university have built this gate out of the notes you guys stole from a mind flayer and we turned the dial to addresses we got from the mind flayer's address book basically and you go on missions to find out what 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 this guy was doing um so every mission was episodic but every mission ends back at that university 24 hours later one long rest or one short rest or three days whatever the the team decided they needed for that mission they come back and they're always back in that city they're always back there they have to have a home base the whole city is their home base. They can put money in the bank. They can do whatever. But realistically, if you don't have a home base, even at the city level, then you're you're going to be traveling all the time. And that's that's if, if that's the gameplay you're going for, then you don't need a home base. Yeah. But once you are always returning to the same place, why isn't that being customized by the players? Everyone likes to put up their own decor, right? They certainly do if they have, like, you see video games all over the place where people, you know, can micromanage their decor, you know, change the color of their carpets, hang up all the various skulls of their enemies. That's absolutely a, a, a big appeal. Slightly less of an appeal when you have two players who want to choose the luster on their toilets in their Fortress of Doom and two players to say, uh, can we, you know, stab some goblins, please? Then planning your little home base thing has to be a downtime action, but I think it can create more story opportunities. If you have a room full of your trophies, like the skull of the evil sorcerer king of Negreth, perhaps his minions are going to come and try and get the skull to, to raise him. So maybe you don't want a home base because you're afraid that it'll be attacked. Maybe it has to be its own dungeon. Maybe that first dungeon you conquered gets repurposed as a as a holding cell for your dangerous objects that need to be kept away from the world. Maybe. I, I, I wonder now, and this is, this is basically my own fault, is maybe we're focusing too much on the downsides of having a home base. We should probably be focusing on the upsides. And I'm, and when I think of upsides, I mean, we're, we sort of hinted at the social um, thing, uh, elements of having your home base, which is that it, it turns you into part of the community. You're uh, the people who are, you know, within sight of your Fortress of Doom. All of a sudden, you, you're you dealing with them on a regular basis. You're, the factions in the surrounding area are um, important. The, you know, the, the wizard lives in the Mountain of Doom next door. Suddenly, he's your neighbor and you have to have good relations. Maybe there is a homeowners association for all of the various Fortress of Dooms in the area. And yeah, you, ha- you have to go to fancy balls and pretend to like each other. We notice you don't have enough heads on spikes outside of your torture chamber. We don't have torture chambers. Wait, wait, wait. We're beside Thay here. How do you not have uh, torture chambers? Uh, the, the association really thinks that you should put some torture chambers in 
just to make sure you're fitting in with the rest of your association. You know, we don't want anyone to stand out too much. Keep those property values high. Look, you need someone to keep your treasure so other adventurers won't steal it. Yeah. Who better to rob than a bunch of guys who, who rob more dangerous people than to go off for extended periods of time leaving their treasure unguarded? Mm. It's the ultimate score. But that's what adventurers are doing all the time. That's the, you know, what about the adventurers that you robbed it for? We gathered up the most dangerous artifacts in the land and put them in this old dungeon that we had cleared out and then restocked the traps off because we'd now put a load of dangerous objects in it. And then these younger adventurers broke in to deal with it. We were the good guys, but then you stole these dangerous artifacts and uh, now we've got to come get you. We were liberators. These people are the thieves. What's the difference? It's our stuff now. Yeah, there's a certain element where, like, if you're in that idea for that sort of engaging with the local area and building it up, presumably you're investing all your ill-gotten gains, not just in your fortress doom, but in, say, the political shenanigans of the nearby town. Maybe you're, maybe to increase your uh, values, you, uh, you know, make sure you bribe the right. These are all boundless opportunities, but does the average player who's just like, I'm going to wander around and be Superman. Do they want to engage with the local area on that level? Or are they merely looking for the novel? D- does your group want to deal with the same people uh, over the course of the campaign and, you know, be married to their ups and downs and who the local fort- uh, doom lords are and, you know, cr- you know, build up the, uh, the kingdom or, you know, become king or, nominate someone to be the other the king instead of you you know do you want to engage that kind of stuff or are you actually seeking the novelty and you want to be in a different dungeon every week yet still mysteriously have enough bags of calling to carry, carry all these sarcophagi what is the end goal of this story that you are telling is it these are the heroes of the land who are clearing out the the blight that the uh, the death of the arch druid has caused, and they must go to each forest and uh, take out the the beholder that lives there, and then return to the central city and find out what the next mission is. In which case, the the whole city becomes their their home base. Does each of them have their own apartment? Does each of them have a house on the outskirts? Even if they don't have treasure, what is their tie to the world? Is there a house there that their family lives in? Does their family have an estate? Is that a lever that their enemies can use against them? Because they always, when they get back to the city, instead of going to their own little house, go and live with their mum and dad, who aren't dead because they haven't written a character whose backstory is like my parents were murdered by the villain. So you go back to, to the town. If you don't have your own place to go, you're endangering other people. Superman comes home. If, if it's obvious he's going home to Lois Lane's house, then she's getting murdered. That's sort of part of the issue is the benefits of being tied down to a particular location are often a lot what we might call intangible stuff like relationships with uh, NPCs or the satisfaction of being lo- in local politics or decor. Like yeah, yeah, you've put uh, you've put the skulls of all your enemies on top of those spikes. What's the mechanical advantage of doing that? I just like skulls on spikes. So yeah, you're if you're tying yourself down to like a home base, you're getting what you might call a lot of intangible benefits. But the downsides can be very tangible because you broke in, someone has stolen all your treasure, which because of your DM's loose interpretation of the rules is actually making you level down. And um, also all of your uh, wives and dogs are dead. Okay, okay. I see I see what you mean by we've only touched on negative downsides and I'm like these are all great story beats. <laughs> that's not a negative at all. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like some people it's like, "Oh, my personal tragedy of um uh, of uh, trying to uh claw my way out of obscurity and become king of by my own hand and no oh, no setbacks." Some people love that and some people are like, "I refuse to play in a game where I have setbacks because the rules say I don't get them." Fair, fair, fair. What if, what if you go, okay, look, you're, 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 you don't want a castle. Sorry, that was a very rambly sentence. You don't want a castle because a castle's a lot of work and a lot of maintenance. But you make the village that's just before you get to the main town is, is not 
their home base, but is their home base. Like that's that's their their stop off point, their touchstone to the world. Rather than go to the big city where it, like there's a million NPCs and every week they go to a different butcher. You can say, look, they arrive in this town, they they have set up base at the edge of this town, the local blacksmith, what's the mechanical advantage? Well, you've cultivated time with the local blacksmith. He's real good at maintaining your equipment. Every time you stop or start an adventure from this blacksmith, he'll do the maintenance on your equipment for free and you'll get some tangible uh, uh, help until like three fights have been done. Then you've got like you've cultivated an experience with that blacksmith. Then you've got to, then you want to defend that blacksmith. So you want to defend that village. The baker makes the best baked goods. What have you got out of them? Oh, well, they always put a little bit of extra honey. They always give you that baker's dozen and you've been bringing back to them magic flour from the windmill at the edge of the tundra. And um and now you've got like you can you can build into that location little mechanical benefits. If you want to give people mechanical benefits for maintaining a home base, you could make that work. Yeah, you absolutely could, but a lot of systems don't bother because they're far more interested in oh, uh installing uh crenellations on the top of your castle walls. That costs one hundred and fifty seven gold pieces per square per foot of crenellation. And the precedence the precedents set by the, the likes of AD and D were that building a base was a you you didn't do it in someone else's house you didn't you weren't just you know leasing a house you were building a stone out of, a stone fortress out of the recently tamed wilderness by your own hand and you know your hundreds of slaves and you were doing all of this to mostly for your own gratification and here's the exact gold piece costs of, uh, of every piece of uh of equipment and there wasn't uh, the precedent for say oh because you're making bonds with this you know well the gm will decide what the benefit of a bond with uh, the baker and the candlestick maker is the benefit is very vague you're right and, and that's something like i i made up on the spot hadn't thought that's of before bad for that it's thing. not bad uh, but it is something that systematically could be in place earlier yeah, where a good relationship with with a community that is your home base community gets you these little things. You could spread that out and go, look, this is the this is the town that has the blacksmith that that has this. This is the town that has the baker that does that. This is the town that has a small library that has particularly interesting occult novel, uh, not novels, uh, books, tomes. Which one are you going to make your home base? Because when things go wrong, that's the one you'll be at which means it's the one that doesn't get burnt down when, when the raid happens, you know? So that's what you want to have. You want to build that forward. Only if that's a, a, a mechanic that exists. But you're talking about a castle in second ed, and, and the castle's guide had, like, the rules for putting spikes on the roof so griffins couldn't land on it. How, much, how expensive it is to roof over your entire courtyard with uh, an iron thunderdome cage that you could still fire out of, but no one could drop rocks in from above. All of that was in those books. If you were a fighter who wanted to build a castle that was a crazy castle that you could defend yourself in, because at ninth level it turned into a war game because the fighter got 150 like infantrymen and 50 cavalry and a bunch of other stuff. But if you were a rogue, if you were a thief, to get your followers at ninth level... You founded a thieves' guild, which could happen in a sewer. It could happen out of a, a butcher shop. It didn't need a castle to get those followers. The ranger didn't need anything to get their followers. The ranger's followers just show up. You get a bear. It's a regular bear. It's not a magic bear. <laughs> it just follows you around. You can't order it to do anything. That was the thing that was really disturbing. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like... Because they sort of, there was this massive set of assumptions that if you're playing this character class, you want this type of late game experience. And people said, no, I, we would rather, in many cases, they just said, no, I'd rather do the level one stuff, but with bigger numbers. The thing is, the gameplay of, you know, your, your link to this small town or this neighborhood in a big city or this other thing, like, that's really, that could be really compelling gameplay, but you're either asking your GM to 
come up with a whole bunch of, of, of stuff was, was like, well, because you have the honey cakes from the baker, you get this, you know, plus D6 hit points on the short rest. Or you're asking for a dedicated game where bonds and, you know, ties and stuff have this definite mechanical impact in the game. Like you say you have contacts as a stat based on, you know, how many contacts you build up in your town or every event you're depending on how many husbands you have, each one of them gives you plus two to mental saves because of your devotion to your family or such like. Yeah, yeah. Does it need to have a mechanical advantage? Not necessarily, but if you want people to understand what they're getting out of it, whereas uh, as opposed to what they're getting out of um, charging from dungeon to dungeon to find the next cool thing or adventure to venture, what's easier for someone to imagine? The, the the next magical suit of plate mail in the next dungeon or the warm and fuzzy feeling of it attending a wedding for of two NPCs that you've been matchmaking for the last 30 sessions. Mechanically, I'm going to care a lot more about a castle maintenance phase if there's a mechanical benefit to it. Yeah. If there's yeah. not, I am going to tolerate a certain amount of it and then I'm going to start to get frustrated. That's when you start asking for the teleport stones. And yeah. The- well, because c- some people will care a lot about this stuff. And other, like, if you're playing dress up with your castle, that's fine. You know, most reasonable people will tolerate a certain amount of it. But after a point, they're interested. They say, "Can we? Do, can you guys do this before the session? Because we've been sitting here arguing about the drapes for so long, and maybe I have to do that in real life, and I don't want to do that in the game." No, I wouldn't want to do that either, no. And I, and I think as well that the spending of treasure on it creates um, a sink for treasure that you can't otherwise spend because the game has, if, if Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition has resulted in you've gotten a lot of money, you've bought your plate mail, but it doesn't matter because you can't get it enchanted for cash. You're going to have to find some, or the GM's just going to give you some plus two plate mail at some point, and then it doesn't really matter that the first one cost 1,500 gold pieces. Now you've an unlimited supply of cash, and the reason for your adventuring is going to have to be story anyway. So if your home base, like when I'm thinking of a home base, I'm not necessarily assuming that you're sitting down with the limited establishing, uh, whether it's a castle or a tavern that the, the party have decided is theirs, or they've built it, or some other place of business where they go, we're going to make the best armory in the world and that'll be our home base. Why would they Why would they do any of those things except for story reasons? Because they're never going to get anything better out of it than magical equipment that they would get through adventure, mechanically speaking. Yeah, and that's that's why you have to think about what mechanic incentives you want to highlight in your game. I recently played in a game run by, I believe, a YouTuber called Eric Volgaris, although it was a private thing, called Stone Top. I believe it's just coming out of like its Kickstarter phase now. And it was very much about you are part of this small town and you're the important people in that small town. It's designed that like the first session of the game is you're setting up the small, ta- the small town. There's sections on like the town's sheet where you write out, uh, oh, here are the major families, here's all of our relatives, here's which of our party member, party members' families are the farmers, and which are the town elders, who's the local druid. We only had about two or three sessions of the whole of the actual gameplay, but every, every part of it, we were dealing with, you know, our relationships with the town, and we really feeling, well, yeah, we, 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 because we put time at the start of the game into developing the town. We all knew each other's relatives. We all basically knew everyone's reputations at the start. And it was really fun to just go for like, you know, the, the town lawyer to or, or law speaker to go, well, I have to have to make, make peace between uh, the blacksmiths and the druids family again because, oh, they're up in arms again. And that w- worked great as, as a short game. Um, and we we were actually kind of sorry that we didn't see because there was mechanics for uh, every season. Do, does our food supply hold out? Uh, are we going to lose lose the flocks of sheep, or is you know going to be going to be a feud with the, the tribe over the hill? 
I was great for that, but that was very specifically designed with the entire session zero or session one of, you know, town building to create that experience. But the average gaming group sort of charges into being adventures going into dungeons and they like there's there's a we talk about the cliche of parents dead like us adventuring, but very often there's people start with the likes adventuring and then five sessions in someone asks about the parents and that's when they pencil in the parents dead part. Because they've 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 charged both feet into the um adventuring part of the game they're uh, about and you know the going into the dungeon, traveling across the land, uh, saving this town, that town, that town because the the GM had three different modules with three different towns in them. Obviously, they can't be the same town. That'd be ridiculous. It says the names of the towns on the modules, but only then do people have to suddenly consider the logistics of well, what we do with all this treasure we've got, and that's when the hard questions come in of do we want to be part of uh, you know a community or engage in politics, or even just find somewhere to invest all this money and hope we don't get uh, stolen by, uh, you know, an NFT scam or whatever. <laughs> just leave the dungeon, leave the treasure in the Dragon's Horde, where it's safe, and uh, charge people interest to make use of it. Um, but I think the, the, the thing is that if you are a group of itinerant adventurers traveling from disaster site to disaster site which is highly suspicious in and of itself that everywhere you go just before you get there there's a disaster are you following the trail of disaster are you driving it on ahead of you does batman cause jokers madness yeah yeah which 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 comes first the the superhero or the supervillain uh the masked adventurers or the masked villains i'll tell you in real life we have real masked villains you know people rob banks with clown masks on that that happens when someone when someone robs a bank they're they're a villain and they dress up crazy so i'd say even if there was no batman there would be a crazy person doing crazy things and batman is a crazy person doing crazy things but again he returns to the bath cave because his his adventuring stomping ground is gotham city if your adventurers are only going forward and have nowhere to re-engage with the story then how are they encountering the same NPCs ever again? They're not. They're only going to encounter a new village with a whole new cohort of NPCs. And eventually the campaign falls apart because there's no nail in the campaign to come back to. And that's what the home base gives you. A nail in the campaign to hang your adventures off. Yeah, and it's a major benefit, but it's also an intangible one that you may not realize you need until you're 15th level and teleporting around and you know you become completely unstuck from the from the uh from the setting as a, as a cohesive unit and you're just thinking of it well which uh, which of these doomed continents do we save this week uh, we can let the others we let the stew a little bit let the challenge rating go up a bit so the xp is better Couple of um, Pathfinder adventure paths have had uh, a home base uh, as a key component. Uh, Age of Ashes had a you were storing your keep uh, to use as your home base, and you know um, Extinction Curse had you in a circus. The circus is not actually super important, but so they had, they've occasionally done stuff like that where hey, you got a home base in this one, and you can do stuff to improve it, and you can basically be, it can be a place to do magical crafting, or it can be a place to you know. Uh, upgrade certain things or make retraining easier. So there are like there's lots of in-game stuff you can do with it. And having a home base, like for example, if you're playing in say a uh, like a Star Wars game, your home base could be a ship, or basically you go back to and like that's how every you work out of this and you you know this is your home, and that could be quite cool in terms of it's also something that's more active. So you could do something in D and D where you've got a crazy moving castle. It's like yes, this is our giant castle that crawls around the landscape. I think it's it's a good compromise to have if you are still in the sort of freewheeling. We want to see what's over the next horizon mode, but you still want to have these kind of yeah, social benefits or castle decor mini game. You know, some kind of traveling base. It's a. I think it's a good thing to have because then it allows you to you know skip over all those random 
So you find three bears in the road. Well, because you're a traveling circus of hundreds of people who have their own three bears in a in in a in one of the carriages, I, I don't think we need to worry about the three bears. We can just assume that they move along. Well, maybe they've been attracted by the smell of your bears and they're like they're enraged that the bears have been kept from them. They're in fact were bears, and one of your bears is a were bear that is stuck in one form, and now you've got to deal with these were bears. I said you, I, I said you had the option to move, um, you know, move random encounters out of your game. Uh, if you do are coming up with a genuine dramatic gold as a random encounter, then uh, that's a different, uh, perhaps a different topic. But yeah, the point to take is like you can gain a lot, a lot of the benefits if you have a we call it a moving base or base that's easy access. Or as you said, uh, I think you had the example of the Gnome University with a Stargate in it. If all you care about is the moment to moment dungeon clear out thing and you're otherwise you're a band of Ronin watering the, the weights, then yeah, just have a different module every week. That's fine. And that's it's abstract where you're, how you're spending the gold. We can assume you turn all to gems or something and uh, just move on every day. Or if you want to have these deep roots where, you know, you know the names of everyone in the castle and defeating the Dark Lord uh, and his five dragons is just as much of an adventure as Jimmy and Bimmy's wedding. These are also a perfect way fine thing. And maybe, sorry, I think I've lost my point. But No, 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 I, I see where you're going. I see where you're going. And I think the thing is, if, if you are doing Scooby-Doo, where you arrive somewhere, having traveled there, and solve the local problem, and then move on, and in between this adventure and the next, functionally nothing happens, then you don't need a base of operations. But if you have a system that has in and of itself some kind of downtime operations, downtime planning, your characters go, I want to make some potions of healing. Where do you do that? Do you rent a, 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 a alchemist's workshop? It's not just... As you were saying there, Jimmy's wedding, you didn't say Jimmy's wedding, but someone's wedding uh, that you're planning for. That's that's a story option. If you're planning for a wedding, then you can the GM can go, OK, we can have we can have the centaurs come and disturb the wedding. We can have the the Wemix go to build your cake. You stole our sacred eggs. You can you can hang some plot on this this wedding because you're going to a wedding because it's involved with the townsfolk where you have the castle that you've built. But if you've got downtime options between your adventures, where did your wizard do their wizarding? Where did your alchemist do their alchemy? Alchemy. Where did the barbarian... What do barbarians do in downtime actions? Mine made a surfboard one time. Probably go fight. <laughs> if you have a robust downtime system for between adventures, between episodes... Are they going straight from disaster to disaster with no time to decompress? Are you spending no time doing things? Have you ever said six months pass? The winter has come. Winter has fallen. No one adventures in the winter. What do you do for the winter? Then you need a base of operations. Another advantage is, uh, as a GM, you don't have to keep thinking up new NPCs that fill the same roles. I don't have to think up, this blacksmith's name is... Joey, Joe, Joe, Shabadoo. That's the worst name I've ever heard of. He wears a tutu and he likes dance. Electronic dance. It doesn't make sense because this is a fantasy world. But, oh, I'm stuck. Uh, and where did he go? No, this is, this is Thorgrim the blacksmith. I have well-developed notes for who Thorgrim is and I've already figured out his accent and it usually stays in Scottish and doesn't deviate into Jamaican. Uh, so yeah, it's all good. You know what? That that's that's not to be sniffed at. I want to go buy. I want to go buy some alchemy items. Then talk to Doctor Insano down the road. Why do you employ Doctor Insano? He works cheap. <laughs> <laughs> or just spend the gold. Also, it it gives your players somewhere to put the NPCs they pick up that you don't want in the baggage train. Oh no! Uh, I've, they've brought back another. 14 orphaned goblins. Well, good thing we've got the goblin orphanage just run by Mrs. Mrs. Goblin, Mrs. goblin Lover. Goblin Orphanage, also known as the Mines. <laughs> Mrs. Goblin Lover is very wealthy. There's a lot of stuff you can do with a, a home base that reduces some of your cruft. Like, for example, 
you can build a map for your home base, right? And then if they decide to have a fight in the home grounds, you have to find a new map. You already got the map there. You're, re- you're reducing your prep. You know, you're reducing your, oh, who can we find to teach us the scrolls? We just, we'll just go talk to Althorius, you know, the uh, Althorius, the almost wise, our, uh, our, our castle wizard. Yeah, that, that, that these are all great options, but the question is, can you just go 50 sessions into a campaign, realize you need this, and then turn it on by just saying, yeah, we take a month to buy a castle, we'll choose these four types of NPCs, and I guess the level three cavalry. Nah, you give them a castle. You make it a quest. You make it a quest reward. Make them earn it. They'll care more. Yeah, that's... Swear to that's God, that's they... the reason. They can't buy a castle. I'll tell you why they can't buy a castle. Because the castle comes with a title and scottage and all of these things around it. If you're buying a castle, you're just getting a pile of bricks. You're not getting a castle. Yeah. you got to earn a castle. Uh, I think it's maybe the thing that was overlooked in the... Because, uh, as you know, this has been points we made, the castle rules in the AD&D, they're not medieval castle rules. They are... We have gone 400 miles into Indian territory, looting pillaging along the way, and started building a wooden fort. And then we will upgrade this wooden fort as we go. That's what the ad d style castle really is. And shockingly, once uh, even though if they never consciously realized this, I think the gaming masses realized why they didn't want to engage that system. And instead, the castle as a quest reward became a far more sensible way of doing this. To a certain extent, absolutely. If you play something like Mastica, that's going to be straight up immediately colonialism. It's the priesthood of Thorm or Helm have gone to the New World and are actively engaged in being conquistadors. If you're playing in a lot of other D&D settings where you're like, there's a wilderness very near our existing fallen civilization, you're not necessarily going into f- your adventurers you're not necessarily going on into into full colonialism mode it's why is this area good for a castle but it has no castle and the answer is it had a castle 10,000 years ago but the last five times our civilization fell into decay and was overrun by a demon horde and then some adventurers closed the gate to the abyss and it reset the world which has happened over and over you're rebuilding I think they tried to do this with, with was it Fourth Ed, where they were like, it's points of light in the darkness. Mm-hmm. And notably, the, the Fourth Ed DMG came with a fully realized hometown in the back with a, a map of the surrounding area, and which, you know, conveniently linked to all of the modules which had been advertised for the, the starting adventuring. So Fourth Ed put in the effort to start you off with a home area uh, and a home base and all of the stuff, and, and then immediately link that into a whole bunch of adventuring opportunities. Yeah, but they measure things in squares, uh, Shane, and that's a hanging offence. <laughs> well, did, not their world map, I presume that used hexes. No? I don't even remember. Or did they just say it's a five-day walk to the next adventure? Uh, no, I think it was a map with, like, miles on it. I don't remember there being hexes, but uh, yeah, the the point is, is taking us as, like, there's a there's this initial setup cost if you want to have this sort of home base based style of campaign, but it's doing that upfront cost will often be an awful lot more efficient than going fifty seven sessions to a campaign and realizing you've got nowhere to stay at store your gold and then so all of a sudden having to hire fifteen wizards to cast wall of stone and build you a fortress in the middle of nowhere. I think if you've gone 57 sessions in and you've got a 15th level wizard, he's storing it in a demiplane of his own creation. Quite likely. I'll tell you this, right? You probably should have a plan. If you're going to do the castle thing, to have a plan early on. So they feel some ownership of the castle, whatever it is, before they maybe get the castle. Maybe they work on the castle or they attack the castle or they liberate the castle or they clear the castle out from monsters. Give them some feeling of ownership of it first and then have it done. It should be part of a long-term plan. It shouldn't be, I'm kind of bored this week. I'm going to give you guys a castle. That's that's the ill-considered approach that is going to lead to ruin. Uh, yeah, and also similarly, if it's your players initiated, make sure it's the you know, team initiated. Because like I said, I think I've talked about this before, where Matt Colville brought out his big supplement about how to build 
castles uh, in uh, in fifth ed, and you had Hawkins options. Uh, your castle gave you all kinds of class features and um, you know special bonuses and customized uh, army lists for each castle. And the immediately the feedback from everyone who saw it was like, "What about our castle? I don't want everyone in the, in the party to have their own castle. We, we want to build the team clubhouse." And this this apparently floored him uh, as a as a realization of how people were, were playing. Yeah, I think I think definitely if you go back far enough, where you go fundamentally, you go chainmail, original D and D, D and D, D and D first edition, advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and so on. You do realize that there is that bleed through from the war game origin that bleeds back up eventually, where you go, and now we've we've done a bit of role playing for a while, but now we better get back to our fantasy Napoleonics. And uh, my character that I played as a as a single character for ages now has a whole army, and I'm going to go off and we're going to play a war game. Yeah, I I know we fought together for forty sessions to defeat the cavern, defeat the caverns of Sokan and liberate our gold. But how do you feel like just, you know, getting some armies and having at it uh, for funsies on next Tuesday? That was something that was okay uh, in a very heavy wargaming focused game. But I, I think the point I was trying to say is like, try to make sure you have group buy it. Like an awful lot of groups, if one player says, I want to be king, most of the rest of the group will uh, fall in behind and say, yeah, I kind of wanted to be a diva and, you know, the, the wizard wanted to avenge his father, but we can do that as part of making the fighter into the king. So most of the time people go along with that. But, you know, if someone is being disruptive about, oh, I want to have castle of my own, uh, that's just probably a bigger topic. That's sort of, you know, personal goals versus, versus uh, team goals. I think it's reasonable for them to have, within the context of a home base, different sorts of goals for that home base. The, the, the roguey character, if he's a thief, doesn't want a castle. That's a total mess. He wants a little den of thieves, shady den of thieves pool hall down the back of the main city's market area, where he can finagle the 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 back end of society's thievery. The cleric wants a shrine. Like he's like, I want my own. I I was the I was a temple uh, hand. I was an altar boy in the big temple in the city, and now I can be head of the the church here on the outskirts frontier town. Like that's that's a great job. I've built this temple up from the ground up, and you know what? That got me a promotion at the end of the campaign. I'm going back to the city. I'm going to be the the bishop. So it it might be reasonable for them to have different different goals to split off at that point, even if they've return to the to the town the small city that they've helped prosper and brought to, to fruition because that's been the plan for most of the campaign not dropped in in, in a late thing the ranger doesn't want a castle he wants to go back and run trail for lost idiots in the wilderness i want a forest and the wizard does not want to waste any of her time doing politics this castle exists so that no one bothers me in my tower. The fighter and the barbarian are arguing over who gets to be king. I don't care. As long as you you guys don't end up causing a disturbance that damages my tower, which is in the middle of the back corner of the castle, you guys do whatever the hell you want. This this castle exists solely so that no one disturbs my research at the top of the tower. guess uh, the, the main thing is, like, these are all cool vibes, but... But they are only vibes. And well, no, 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 it's not that vibes are vibes can be a very vitally important part of your uh, RPG experience. It's just make sure your one person's reaction to all of this stuff isn't harshing someone else's. I guess if someone wants to really avoid politics and it would actually like, upset them to um, have to deal with the homeowners association of evil overlords, maybe make the focus less on you know promotions and backstabbing and organization stuff and more about you know the random npcs around the castle who are cool and you like because you saved them from the goblin hordes of level one but uh yeah the the difficulty with home bases in general is they can take so many different that's why we've been rambling for an hour about them is that they can take so many different forms and you can go into the penny pinching 
know, design spikes in the front of your castle, or you can abstract it all, never have a mechanic thing about it at all, and it's just a handy way for the GM to come up with interesting NPCs and put them somewhere. And it could be anything in between. And that's why very few RPGs have a universal system for having home bases because it's the quantum thing. As soon as you put a system in, there's going to, you're going to find people who for that system or those suggestions do not work properly. And therefore, a lot of RPGs just cow it out and make no system at all and just leave it on the jam. <laughs> yep, pretty much. I think we've gone around the houses a bit. Uh, they're very nice houses. We paid 10,000 gold pieces for each of them. To do our downtime actions in. Yeah. Downtime actions. And those goblin slaves better work off all that money that we invested in their housing. <laughs> so uh, if you have had an extravagant real estate purchase in your RPGs and then found difficulty managing it, why not join us on our social media? Or even better, hit us up on our Discord. Or... If you feel like watching some food getting eaten at 11 o'clock at night or some retro games getting played, why not check out Gifford Geo on Twitch? Alrighty. But for now, this party and the the great party house it takes place in is over. Thanks for listening to the Adventure Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there or talk to our Twitter account at AdventurePTY or you can record a voice message at www.speakpipe.com slash theadventuringparty. We can also be contacted directly by email at party at theadventuringparty.net. If you'd like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server, link in the show notes. The Adventuring Party was released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike and Version 3 license.